Casey, you and I have written a few times over the years about the issue of content moderation on social media. Yeah, one of the biggest issues it seems like anyone wants to talk about when it comes to the social networks. And this week is a particularly big week in content moderation land because the Supreme Court of the United States heard arguments for two cases that are directly related to this issue of how social networks can and cannot moderate the content on their services. On Monday, Supreme Court justices heard close to four hours of oral arguments over the constitutionality of two state laws. One came out of Florida, the other is in Texas. Both of these laws restrict the ability of tech companies to make decisions about what content they allow and don't allow on their platform. They were both passed after uh, Donald Trump was banned from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube following the January 6th riots at the Capitol. Um, Florida's law limits the ability of platforms like Facebook to moderate content posted by, quote, journalistic enterprises and content, quote, by or about political candidates. Mm -hmm. It also requires that content moderation on social networks be carried out in a consistent manner. Texas's law has some similarities, but it prohibits internet platforms from moderating content based on political viewpoint, uh, with a few exceptions. Yeah, so this is a really big deal. Right now, platforms remove a bunch of content that is not illegal. You know, you're allowed to insult people, maybe even lightly harass them. You can say racist things. You can engage in other forms of hate speech. That is not against the law. But platforms, ever since they were founded, have been removing this stuff because, for the most part, people really don't want to see it. Well, then along come Florida and Texas, and they say, we don't like this, and we're actually going to prevent you from doing it. So if these laws were to be upheld, Kevin, you and I would be living on a very different internet. So I think when it comes to content moderation uh, and its legal challenges, this is the big one. Uh, this pair of lawsuits is what will determine um, how and if platforms have to change the way that they moderate content dramatically. Yep. But Kevin, we want to bring in some help to get through the legal issues here today. Yes. Yeah, so we've invited today an expert uh, on these issues who's been grappling with questions of free speech and social media and content moderation for roughly two decades. Uh, this is Daphne Keller. Tell us about Daphne. Daphne is the person that reporters call when anything involving internet regulation pops up. She is somebody who has spent decades on this issue. She's currently the director of the program on platform regulation at Stanford's Cyber Policy Center. She has done a lot of great writing on these cases in particular, including a couple of incredibly helpful uh, FAQ pages that have helped reporters like me try to make sense of all of the issues involved. Daphne also formally submitted her own view used to the Supreme Court in an amicus brief that she helped write and file on behalf of political scientist Francis Fukuyama. Yeah, so Daphne is opposed to these laws, we should say. She believes that they are unconstitutional and that the Supreme Court should strike them down. But this is not a view she came to lightly or recently. Um, she's been working in the field of tech and tech law uh, for many years. We'll link to her great FAQs in the show notes. Uh, but today, for sort of a breakdown of these cases and how she thinks the Supreme Court is likely to rule, we wanted to bring her on. So let's bring in Daphne Keller. Daphne Keller, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. So I want to just start, can you just help us lay out the main arguments on either side of these cases? What are the central claims that Texas and Florida are using to justify the way that they want to regulate social media companies? So, I mean, it's not that far away from the basic political version of this fight. The rationale is these are liberal California companies, or they were liberal California companies, and they're censoring conservative voices. And that, you know, that needs to stop. My understanding is that this is probably the only Supreme Court case in the history of the Supreme Court that uh, had its origins in a Star Trek subreddit. Can you explain that whole thing? <laughs> So th this isn't literally from that case, but, but so Texas and Florida passed their laws. The platforms ran as fast as they could to courts to get an injunction so the laws couldn't be enforced. Um, but a couple of cases got filed in Texas and the most interesting one, I thought there was just one, I think now there are two actually, but the most interesting one is somebody who posted on the Star Trek subreddit that Wesley Crusher is a soy boy. I, <laughs> yeah. I had to look up what soy boy means. It's kind of like junior cuck or something. Yeah, yeah people it's, often call us soy boys. It's That's a kind a... of like a conservative slur meaning weakling, I yes. think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
because I sit here drinking my green juice. <laughs> but it's, at least it's not soy milk. That's right. 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 Yeah. So, so the moderator, it wasn't even Reddit, the yeah. moderators of that subreddit took that down. Yeah, or because of some rule that they have. I, don't I mean, know it's it deeply exactly. offensive to members of the Star Trek community and the soy boy community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the and the person, I'm gonna guess it's yeah. a guy. Yeah. Sued, saying this violates the obligation in Texas's law to be viewpoint neutral, and it, it's an it's a useful example because it's such a like total real world content moderation dispute about some dumb crap. But the question of, like, what does it mean to be viewpoint neutral on the question of whether Star Trek characters are soy boys is, like, I, I think helpfully illustrates how impossible it is to figure out what platforms are supposed to do it, under these laws. Exactly. You sort of you take this very silly case, you extrapolate it across every platform on the Internet, and you ask yourself, how are they supposed to act in every single case? And it just seems like we would be consumed with endless litigation. So you just returned from Washington um, where these uh, cases were being argued in front of the Supreme Court. S sketch the scene for us, because I've never been. Um, what's it like? Um, so you start out, well, if you're me, you pay somebody to stand in line overnight for you. Wow. Because I'm old, I'm not going to do that but shit. But you really had, to, someone has to stand in line overnight for this. I had somebody there wow. from 9 p.m. and he was number 27 in line wow. and they often let in about 40 people. Wow. How do you find so. these people to just stand in line? Uh, skiptheline.com. Wow. Great, 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 great tip for listeners. I learned something <laughs> yeah. today. Okay. Rick did great, great job Shout out to Rick. <laughs> Right. Um, anyhow, so you, you stand around in the cold for a long time. Uh, then they let you in in stages, one of which the best part definitely is you stand in this like resonant, beautiful marble staircase. And a member of the Supreme Court police force explains to you that if you engage in any kind of free speech activity, you will spend the night in jail. <laughs> it's like very firm, polite. Um, well, and, and it's also interesting to hear that there is effectively content moderation on everyone who is in the room before they even enter. They say, yeah. hey, you know, you open your mouth and you're out of here. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And you can't wear buttons that say anything. Because oh. yeah. mm. the justices find this very distracting, anything that's sort of shiny or glints in the light. <laughs> So the people making these arguments um, represent uh, NetChoice, which is a, a trade association for the tech companies. It's sort of their lobbying group. Um, who else is opposed to these laws? Uh, so I should say that CCIA, which is a, a different tech trade association, is also a plaintiff, and they always get short shrift because they're not the first named party. Um, but the you know a, a whole lot of individual platforms filed or free expression oriented groups filed. Lots of people weighing in who are interested in different facets of the issue. I see, and. For those of our listeners who may not be American or may not have much familiarity with how the Supreme Court works, my understanding is in these oral arguments, you know, the justices rain questions down on the attorneys. They try to answer them as best they can. Then they go away and deliberate and uh, and write their opinions. So we don't actually know how they're going to opine or, or rule in this case. But did you hear anything during oral arguments that kind of indicated to you which way this case might be headed? Um. There's, so there's a lot of tea leaf reading that goes on based on what happens in oral arguments. And usually that's the last set of clues you get until the opinion issues, which seems likely to be in June or something like that. In this case, there's actually another case being argued in March that's related and might give us some interesting clues. But from this week's argument, it was pretty clear that a number of the justices thought the platforms clearly have First Amendment protected editorial rights. And it's not like that's the end of the question, because sometimes the government can override that with a good enough reason. But it seemed like there was, I think, a majority for that. But then they all kind of got sidetracked on this question of whether they, they could even rule on that um, because the law has some other potential applications. And they got into like a lawyer procedural rules fight that um, could you know, cause the outcome to be weird in some way. So, so let me ask about that, because, you know, to go back to our uh, our our soy boy example, to me, if a if a if a private business wants to have a website and they want to make a rule that says you can't call anybody a soy boy around here, that does seem like the sort of thing that would be protected under the First Amendment. You know, you, you, you write your policies under that sort of First Amendment. Why is that not the end of the story here? Well, so what Texas or Florida would say is that these laws only apply to the biggest platforms, 
And they're so important that they're basically infrastructure now. And you can't be heard at all unless you're being heard on YouTube or on X or on Facebook. And so that's different. Yeah. So what is the, what is the argument from the states about why they should be allowed to uh, sort of, you know, impinge on this First Amendment right that these platforms say that they have to moderate content however they want to, their private businesses? What do the states say in response to that? They say the platforms have no First Amendment rights in the first place, that that's fake, you know, that what the platforms are doing isn't speech, it's censorship, or what the platforms are doing is conduct, or mostly they just allow all of the posts to flow, so the fact that they take down some of them shouldn't matter. A lot of arguments like that, none of which are super supported by the case law, but the court could change the case law. I want to ask you about another um, conversation that came up during these oral arguments that you referenced earlier, which was which platforms do these laws apply to? There is some confusion about this. And it seemed like the justices had questions about, OK, maybe if we want to set aside for a second the the Facebooks and the, and the X's and the YouTubes, what about like an Uber or a Gmail? Like you could argue Uber is like a modern day stagecoach company. Maybe there should be a kind of equal right of access there. So I look at that and I say, well, that's a good reason not to pass laws that affect every single platform the same way. But I'm curious how you heard that argument. And maybe if you have any thought about how the justices will make sense of which law applies to what and what might be constitutional and what might not be. Yeah. So that part of the argument, I think, caught a lot of people, including me, off guard. I, we did not expect it to go in that direction. But I'm a, I'm a little bit glad it did. Like, I think it was the justices recognizing we could make a misstep here and have these consequences that we haven't even been thinking about. And so we need to look really carefully at what they might be. Um, and in the case of the Florida law in particular, the definition of covered platforms is so broad. It explicitly includes web search, which I'm a former <laughs> legal lead for Google web search, full disclosure. Um, and it seems like it includes infrastructure providers like Cloudflare. Um, so it's it's really, really broad who gets swept in. And I reluctantly must concede, I think the justices were right to pause and worry about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. A lot of the people I saw commenting on the oral arguments this week um, suggested that this was kind of going to be a slam dunk for the tech companies, that they had, uh, you know, that they had done a good job of demonstrating that these laws in Texas and Florida were unconstitutional and that it sounded after these arguments like the justices were likely to side with the tech platforms. Um is that your take too? I think there I think enough of them. You need 5. I think at least 5 of them are likely to side with the platform saying yes you have a speech right and yes this law likely infringes it. But because of this whole back and forth they got into about the procedural aspect of how the challenge was brought, it could come out some weird ways. For example, the court could um reject the platform's challenge and uphold the laws, but do so in an opinion that pretty clearly directs the lower courts to issue a more narrowly tailored injunction that just makes the law not apply to speech platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there, there are a lot of different ways they could do it, some of which would formally look like the state's winning, although it wouldn't in substance be the state's winning against the platform's you know, that we're talking about most of the time, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the um, TikToks. Very interesting. Yeah. So we've talked about these laws on the show before, and I think we can all agree that there are some serious issues with them. Um, they could force platforms operating in these states to, you know, open the floodgates of harassment and toxic speech and, you know, uh, pro-suicidal content and all these kinds of things that we can all just agree are horrible. But there is also an argument being made um, that ruling against these cases, striking these laws down, um, could actually do more damage. Uh, Zephyr Teachout, who's a, a law professor at Fordham, wrote an article in The Atlantic recently about uh, this these social media laws called Texas's social media law is dangerous. Striking it down could be worse, basically making the case that if you strike down these laws, you basically give tech giants kind of un unprecedented and unrestrained power. Um, what do you make of that argument? So I, I read the brief that Zephyr filed along with Tim Wu and Larry Lessig, and it, it's like they're writing about a different law than the actual law that is in front of the court. Um, and, you know, I, I think 
Their worry is important. You know, if the court ruled on this in a way that precluded privacy laws and precluded consumer protection laws, that would be a problem. But there are a million ways for the court to rule on this without stepping on the possibility of you know, future better federal privacy laws, for example. It's not some you know binary decision where the platform's winning is going to change the ground rules for all those other laws. So you don't worry that if this case comes out in the company's favor that they are going to be sort of massively empowered with new, new powers that they didn't have before? Well, I mean, if the court wanted to do it that way, if there are five of them who wanted to do it that way, then it could come out that way. But I, I can't imagine them, five of them, wanting to empower platforms in particular that way. And I can't imagine the liberal justices wanting to you know, rule in a way that undermines like the FTC from being able to do the regulation that it does. Mm -hmm. a, a big topic that comes up in discussions of law and tech policy is Section 230. This is the part of the Communications Decency Act that um, basically gives broad legal immunity to platforms that host user-generated content. This is something that conservative politicians and some some liberal politicians want to repeal or amend to kind of take that immunity away from the platforms. This is not a set of cases about Section 230, but I'm wondering if you see any ways in which the way that the Supreme Court rules on this could affect how Section 230 is applied or interpreted. Well, you might think it's not a case about 230 because they agreed to review a First Amendment question, full stop, but the states managed to make it more and more uh, like a case about 230, and multiple justices had questions about it. So it won't be too surprising if we get a ruling that says something about 230. I really hope not, because that wasn't briefed. That you know, This wasn't what the courts below ruled on. It hasn't really been teed up for the court. It's just they're, they're interested in it. Um, they're kind of there are two ways that two thirty runs into this. I think one will be two in the weeds for you, but the 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 more interesting one is lots of the the justices have said things like, "Look, platforms, either this is your speech and your free expression when you decide what to leave up, or it's not, and you're immunized. You know, pick one. How can it possibly be both?" And the answer is, no, it can definitely be both. Like That was the purpose of Section 230, was that Congress wanted platforms to go out there and have editorial control and moderate content. Literally, the goal was to have both at once. Uh, also, it if the platforms have First Amendment rights in the first place, it's not like Congress can take that away by passing an immunity statute. That would be a really good one weird trick. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad they can't do that. So th there are a lot of reasons that, that that argument shouldn't work, but it's it's very appealing, I think, in particular to people whose concept of media and information systems was shaped in about 1980, you know, where like if, if the rule is you have to be either totally passive, like a phone company, and transmit everything, or you have to be like NBC Nightly News, and they're just a couple of privileged speakers and lawyers vet every single thing they say, then you're going to get those two kinds of communication systems. You'll get phones and you'll get broadcast, but you will never get the internet and internet platforms and places where we can speak instantly to the whole world, but also have a relatively civil forum because they're doing some content moderation. Sounds like there's a downside to having a meeting major of a Supreme Court justice during 70 years. <laughs> Almost. I don't, know, I don't know what the real age is. I'm sure we'll pick up that later. Now, Kevin, do you want to tell her who wrote the 230 question? <laughs> <laughs> Why, well, you're going to out me like this? I'm out you. So this was a great question uh, that I unfortunately did not write, but the uh, the perplexity search engine did. Because uh, I, I gave it the prompt, write 10 penetrating grad student level questions for a law and policy expert about the net choice cases. In fairness, I did think it was a pretty good question. It was a very good question. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, you're really you're really doing me dirty here. I was gonna get away with that. We look, we wrote the rest of the questions. It's we true. just wanted a little help to make sure we, you know, left no stone unturned. Yeah, yeah. And it was a pretty smart, que pretty smart question. Smarter than I would have come up with. And, and let's say the answer way better than the question. That's yes, fabulous. that's yeah. true. I, I, a student of mine sent me a screenshot of something he got from ChatGPT. He'd asked for sources on some two thirty related thing, and it cited an article that it pretended I had written, which did not exist, <laughs> called <laughs> "The Twitter Files in Section Two Thirty That Was in a Non-Existent Journal Called Like the Columbia <laughs> Journal of Law and Technology." Or, 
It looked very plausible. Here's what I'm saying. I'm comfortable being cited in things I didn't write as long as they were good and in prestigious journals. You know what I mean? <laughs> I loved your submission to the New England Journal of Medicine. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> it was really good. It saved a lot of lives. Um, so, Daphne, we've talked about how the court will or may handle this cases, but I'm also curious how you think they should handle this. You and some other legal experts filed an amicus brief in this case. Um sort of arguing for... Actually, let's say this once and for all. Is it amicus or is it amicus, Daphne? It's both and. Okay, great. Go wow. on, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> and s- some people say the plural amici. Oh. Ooh. oh I, I ordered I, that at an Italian restaurant once. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw him DJ in Vegas. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so can you just articulate your position in that brief about how you think the court could and maybe should handle this? Yeah, so this is not how the parties have framed it. This is some wonks coming in and saying you framed it wrong. But I do actually think they framed it wrong. Um, So there's in kind of a standard set of steps in answering a First Amendment question, you ask, did the state have a valid goal in enacting this law? And does the law actually advance that goal? And does it have a unnecessary, you know, damage to speech that could have been avoided through a more narrowly tailored law? So... In this case, the states say we had to pass this law because the platforms have so much centralized control over speech. Let's assume that's a good goal. Uh, We say that doesn't mean the next step is the state takes over (laughs) and takes that centralized control to, to impose the state's rules for speech. There are better next steps that would be more narrowly tailored, that would be a better sort of means and fit, and in particular... Uh, steps that empower users to make their own choices using, you know, interoperability or so-called middleware tools for users to select from a a competing environment of content moderation. What would this look like? This would be like a toggle on your, you know, your Reddit app that would say, I want soy boy uh, content or I don't want soy boy content. So it it could look like a lot of different things, but I know you guys have have talked to Jay from Blue Sky. Like it could look like what Blue Sky is trying to do with having third parties able to come build their own ranking rules or their own speech blocking rules. And then users can select which of those they want to turn on. It could look like Mastodon with different interoperating nodes where the administrator of any one node sets the rules. But if you're a user there, you can still communicate with your friends on other nodes who have chosen other rules. It could look like Block Party. Back when Block Party was working on Twitter, you sort of you know download block lists that are this was an app that other basically lets you like block a bunch of people at once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, it, it could look like a lot of different things, and all of them would be better than what Texas and Florida did. <laughs> right. I wonder if you can sort of steel man the, um, the, the argument on the other side of this case a little bit. I, I was going through this exercise myself because on one hand, like, I do think that these laws are a bad idea. On the other hand, I think that the tech platforms have in some cases made their own bed here by being so opaque and unaccountable when it comes to how they make rules governing platforms and frankly, spending a lot of time obfuscating about what their rules are, what their process is, doing these fake oversight boards that actually have no you know, democratic accountability. It's, it's a kangaroo court. Come on. And I think you, I, I think I'm somewhat sympathetic to the view that these platforms have too much power to decide what goes and what doesn't go on their platforms. But I don't want it to be a binary choice between Mark Zuckerberg making all the rules for online speech along with Elon Musk and other platform leaders and you know, Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis doing it. So I like your idea of a kind of a middle path here. Are there other middle paths that you see where we could sort of make the process of governing social media content moderation more democratic without literally turning it over to politicians and state governments? It's actually really hard to use the law to arrive at at any any, any kind of middle path other than this kind of competition-based approach we were talking about before. Um, the problem is what I call lawful but awful speech. A lot of people use that, um, which is this really broad category of speech that's protected by the First Amendment. So the government can't prohibit it and they can't tell platforms they have to prohibit it. And that includes lots of pro-terrorist speech, lots of 
t- scary threats, you know, lots of hate speech, lots of disinformation, lots of speech that really everybody across the political spectrum does not want to see and doesn't want their kids to see when they go on the Internet. But if the government can't tell platforms they have to regulate that speech people morally disapprove of, but that, that's legal and First Amendment protected, then their hands are tied. You know, then then that's how we wind up in this situation where um, – Instead, we rely on private companies to make the rules that there's this great moral and social demand for from users and from advertisers. And that's just it, – it's extremely hard to get away from because of that delta between what the government can do and what private companies can do. Mm. Nice. Well, some people have described our podcast as lawful but awful speech, so <laughs> I hope that we will not end up targeted by these laws. Uh, Daphne Keller, thank you so much for joining us. Really a pleasure to have you. Thank Thanks you, for having me. Hey, that's the end of this clip. If you liked what you saw, head on over to our page and subscribe, and you can get the full podcast. We do a show like this almost every week on tech and the future. Head on over there now and subscribe. Subscribe.